introduce today's keynote. So Lindsay Jackson is the CEO and co-founder of the, an ag tech business called Platform. She's been working with open source technologies for over 15 years with involvement in many communities such as Drupal, GovHack, EFA, Open Agriculture, and other things. Living in regional South Australia, she's a passionate person um, in wanting to bring technology experiences to those living outside the major production centres in the community and inspiring them to use technology to express themselves and realise their aspirations. A committed advocate for inclusion, diversity and digital skill development, she believes that broadcasting participation in tech has the power to enrich and transform regional lives, communities, economies and main streets. So please take it away, Lindsay. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me because um, it's such a privilege. Oh, it's very bright. It's such a privilege to be able to do a keynote. This is um, this is my first keynote on this topic, uh, and just even the process of having to put it together and uh, they're really long. Uh, thinking about all of that um, was was a really was a really great process. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and also, I should also thank you for the Linux grant that we got earlier in the year to create a project in regional. South Australia for young people that have aspirations of getting into digital, digital technology, gaming, uh, design, things like that. So you can see a little bit of information about that um, in the book and your report uh, as well. So thank you. Okay, this is going to get a little bit feisty, but the light is so bright I can't see anyone's faces. So I'm just going to pretend that you're all taking it. <laughs> um, so I hate to be the one to tell you this, but everyone in this community, whether you're, whether you're in the room or not, carries the burden of being a person with privilege. And with privilege comes responsibility. And the world right now is at a point where it's fucked. And if people don't do something about it, and every one of us are people, and because you're technologists, you have a higher burden than most. I'm sorry to be the bearer of this bad news. But I'm also going to help you, so you don't have to worry. Viscerally, I hate talking about myself. If this was a psychology conference, maybe we would say it's because I'm a woman and I'm used to silencing myself around men who don't want to hear me speak. And women are in fact conditioned like that from a young age, particularly ones who grow up in small country towns, who have tradie men or furniture removalist men or farmer men in their social circles. Uh, now, I've done this thing where I can't move my thing. Um, or maybe we would try and diagnose my neurodiversity. Um, and a lot of people have been doing that lately. So we're on to the first slide, where we have Paris Hilton. She's just released a biography, and she talks about her ADHD. So that's about to become hot, which is exciting. And she describes, <laughs> she describes it as her superpower. For those of you under 30 who don't know who Paris is, her series The Simple Life with Nicole Ritchie is television gold. And trust me, watch it, you'll thank me later. And on that, I do want to thank Hugh on Tuesday for bringing his ADHD diagnosis to the stage. I don't want to make you feel even more uncomfortable, but statistically speaking, I bet there is a lot of neurodiversity in this audience. But today I am going to talk about me because it's going to allow us to build trust. And because I am anybody, and now this is not working, oh, um, because I'm anybody, and that's going to help you to see how you can be somebody. Oh, there we go. I'll give you this slide. How about that? This is trying to convince you how technical I am, and I can't get this working. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, for us to really connect, you're going to have to decide if I'm similar enough to you. And I suggest you're going to have to decide if I'm really a geek. Is she the real deal? But first, I'm going to acknowledge my privilege. I'm going to tell you about a whole lot of barriers that I face. But I'm white, I was born in Australia, and I have access, had access to a quality education system. And I have the capacity, health, and personality to build confidence to navigate systems. And I'm also going to acknowledge that we're still in a global pandemic and that COVID is an ongoing health crisis. We're all in this room because of the privilege of our health or how we perceive our health. And there are many in this community that are still living in isolation to preserve they, their safety because of society's broader lack of precaution. <laughs> and 
And then let me acknowledge that we're on the land of the Nam people, that sovereignty was never ceded, and that we'll have an upcoming referendum on First Nations acknowledgement in the Constitution, and that Australia has a terrible, racist, recent history of the abhorrent treatment of Indigenous people, which is still part of our society and our structures and attitudes today. Let's begin. So I grew up in a small community in South Australia. It used to be 5,000 people, and now it's 6,000 people. And there are three, yeah, there are three towns, so about 18,000 people. And the council are currently rebranding the three towns to be a city of, the city of the Copper Coast. And many people are very anxious about this. When you're a young person growing up in country towns in the late 90s, all you want to do is leave. Now I live there by choice, kind of, mostly. Uh, it does have epic beaches and no traffic. And sometimes a lack of external stimulation is good for business and high-functioning minds, sometimes. And I don't really know how young people feel about living and growing up in the community anymore, because young people are hidden. The over 65 community is the only one that gets to matter. They're the ones that are visible. And they're the ones that complain a lot. <laughs> when I was 19, I was feeling really lost. And this feeling of having times where I feel lost is one that carries through my next 20-ish years as a theme. And I think other people relate to this as well. So I'm going to reference these moments in case you do relate. I went to a talk in a really disadvantaged part of Adelaide, and that talk shaped the direction of my life, just like that. The presentation was from a person called Peter Kenyon, who consults with an organisation called the Bank of Ideas on Regional Development. And he reframed what I thought about community, young people and capacity. So I ended up doing my apprenticeship with him for a number of years, and the key concepts that framed that work was building social capital, which relates to the social norms, the networks, and the trust that facilitates cooperation within and between groups, asset-based community development, and appreciative inquiry. And I can leave you to look, at, look up those terms, but if I recall correctly, uh, Donna gave a talk on appreciative inquiry at a Drupal comp that I attended. So these concepts of community framing have likely made it their way into this community as well, realised or not. I started a quest to care about community and entrepreneurialism, especially uh, social entrepreneurialism and regions. My first act was to join the Neighbourhood Watch Group, which is really just local citizen surveillance with the police stopping by to drop some gossip and see if anyone had any intel to share. That's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, on Tuesday in Pia's talk, this is the first time I'd heard someone note this, but she noted that because Australia was set up as a penal colony, our systems of government have been set up to be punitive. And this gives a lot of insight into our systems and structures and why we as a nation are a bunch of dibber-dobbers. White Australians, anyway. Actually, we're dibber-dobbers, but we're also shit at speaking up. So I remember during this time reading a small article that if eight people complained about television reception to ACMOR or whoever, they'd look into it. Eight. So that was when I first had a data point on what it took to get government attention. Because Australians don't want to be seen as whingers, very few people complain. So eight people making a complaint was significant, and that's pretty wild when you think about it. I moved back to the country for a couple of years, and during this time I started getting involved in things like consultations and focus group style things. So one example is where we, someone was writing a youth policy, so there was a listening tour, and our voices were listened to, and reports were written. And actually I went to about a half a dozen of these sorts of things in a short period of time, and they had the same theme and the same outcome. But once I got pizza and $20 for participating, and that was awesome. In Australia, we love writing reports and doing listening and avoiding real work to make change, because doing things is hard and our political cycles are short. 
And I started to realize that there was an entire system set up to amplify my disadvantage. And not only that, an industry, jobs, livelihood, reliant on my disadvantage. I was a statistic, a female youth living in a regional town from a single parent household, university dropout twice at that point. Grown-ups needed funding because their data showed I was disadvantaged and that if you grow up in my area, you're statistically likely to be a massive loser. <laughs> and so, that shapes things, and it still does. And 20 years on in my region, in regional Australia, the statistics are no better. What we're doing isn't working. But back then, it's OK. I'm an optimistic youth, and I believe that people can change the world, and I am people, so I can help change the world. And I just get more resilient, more optimistic, more skilled, and I guess more defiant. So when I was 26, um, I just moved back to my regional town again, and I had my first baby. And I have this theme of being stuck in a regional town with a baby, which means a lot of free time and a lot of free time with pressure and hormones and lack of sleep and feeling pretty fucked as the next big career move goes. And lost. And remember above times of feeling lost, that happens at these points too. Luckily, it was the era of Kevin 07. And as part of new Prime Minister Kevin Rudd's first thing, he held a 2020 summit, and a 1,000 people from 10 streams were invited. And I, having no idea on what to do next in my life, take this as a possible sign. Emboldened by a glass of red wine, I emailed Tim Costello. He was the CEO of, of uh, global charity World Vision and was leading one of the streams. And we'd had a recent interaction at a recent event. And I write to him and ask if I can attend, and I'm told how to apply. And when the list of attendees is published online, my name is on it. And I go, and I meet someone who would become my boss, and I would spend the next eight-ish years building in Joomla and Drupal and a bit of CV CRM for not-for-profits and government organisations. One of the biggest impacts we can make as a community is to make easier transitions for people who come into tech via accidental opportunity. And that includes the career path once you're in. It is a hard industry to navigate, especially if you don't have the right connections or if you're not the right type of person. Technology as an accident or, uh, uh, or trouble finding work happens far too frequently for women and other underrepresented groups. A lack of diversity in, com in the community and industry, in fact, any community and industry, is a huge problem and a risk. And if we look around this room, which I can't do because it's so bright, um, but it is lacking in diversity. Gender, culture, race, age. We're not representative of society or even the Australian technical community. And groups that are not re representative can become irrelevant or lazy or dangerous. Spending 20 years with community groups in regional areas, all they ever want to know is, how do we get young people to attend? And 20 years ago, when they said young people, they meant under 50. <laughs> now they mean under 70. <laughs> community regeneration is really difficult. We naturally see communities established, grow together, and then age out. And if we let them age out, they die out, and we lose the structures and the governance frameworks. But changing community groups is hard, because it means the people in them have to intentionally change how they see themselves and their role. And they may have to step down, step back, or step aside. And asking yourself, am I relevant? Could someone else be doing more with this privilege? Or can I let go and see others make changes that I know will cause some issues can be hard to do. But communities do age out and need to change. And I need you to pause here and think about our own technical communities and where they are, because I am seeing a lot of them ageing out. And it's not because you're old per se, but because the reason that geeks built these communities was to build careers, build skills and build friendships. And if you're not in that place anymore, that's fine. But of course there are young people that need those things today. They could make new spaces, I guess. 
But what if they don't or can't? And do we really want them to go do community elsewhere? But back to my life. <clears throat> As I was building the National Homelessness at the National Clearing House for Homelessness in Joomla, which would later be deleted from the server when the political ambition of halving homelessness by 2030 was discarded by the next minister, I realised that technology was the enabler for everything I aspired to create, support and build community. And everything that I, in, and then with that, I embarked on 11 ish years or so of talking to other people about technology and community, with neither side really having any idea about the other when I tried to talk to them. Oops, <clears throat> I've um, smushed this up when I tried to combine the two. And even though a lot has changed, society still feels really uncomfortable with technology and their capability to have control over it or make decisions about it. And I see this in all facets that I operate in. As technologists, we've done a wonderful job of building so many great tools, and we should be very proud. The alignment between the worlds isn't fully there, but it is so, so close. Well done to us. During this period of my life, I built over 100 sites for not-for-profit and government organisations around Australia, and lots of them are still alive today. And I turned people who had never touched a CMS in before into content administrators, and that was wonderful. And also, also, I mostly just did work and paid bills and lived. I didn't know that I was about to hit another one of those life moments. The web company that I was working for closed for lots of business and tech trend reasons. Pregnant, I'd taken over as CEO to try to turn it around, but it wasn't to be. And I once again found myself with a tiny baby in a regional town, no job, with all of my thoughts and all of my drive to make the world a better place and nowhere to channel it. So I start doing what I know, community building. And the first step was to infiltrate the Drupal community because I had zero connections and everything that I wanted to be building was in Drupal. So I needed to have more dev friends. And that, my friends, is a hard community to crack. Unnecessarily hard. And I would argue to their detriment, but I'll save elaboration on this for when I'm invited to do a keynote at one of their events. <laughs> I did become very successful at it though, um, and I have connected with many wonderful people from all over the world and have had some excellent opportunities arise. I'm not disparaging by any means, but it's tough to love to build in something when progression feels like an uphill battle. But of course, even though communities can, can contain share, oh, I keep jumping on this one. Um, even though communities can contain frustrating barriers and blockers, we know that building things with like-minded people and having shared goals of openness, transparency and knowledge sharing is powerful and wonderful. Open source communities are very similar to regional communities. Collective good, shared vision, skin in the game. And the thing that struck me the most about the community that I hadn't experienced before was technical privilege. In regional community development and in the not-for-profit sector, we have great, great people, amazing ideas, huge potential, but never any money. Uh, and admittedly, it's a sector that does better than the arts. Um, but in technology communities, we have the ability to build and the specialised technical expertise to charge. And I know there are times when open source in particular feels thankless, and at the community edges we've struggled to find sustainable models of sustainable funding or pay people a living wage for necessary community management work. But I once did a talk and had the costs of, the, the costs of my um, flight overseas to deliver it covered. Mind blown. Like, that does, and that does not happen. And we hold these conferences and we listen to these speakers and they are phenomenal in their knowledge and insight and they're friends and colleagues. So they just kind of seem ordinary, but they're not. And I don't think we come anywhere close to utilising this talent and exposing other people in, in society to their greatness. And that could be something that we work on. Let me give you a few slides when I did a thing with all this technical knowledge and community tools and internet access. Now we'll see if we can do that over here. Oh, there we go. 
Robo-debt was a breach of the trust by the government when it came to technology and data. And honestly, I don't know how we're going to win this back. We had this era of open gov, open gov hack, open data, gov CMS, technology and open technology in the public service was gaining momentum and then we saw that trust broken. And while trust in government was being dismantled, the community trust through robo-debt advocacy, through Not My Debt and in open and closed communities online was growing. There's a, I'll give you some little pictures, let's do a little pictures. These are pictures that were sent to me throughout the campaign. This is us. <laughs> Someone was in the, in the UK and they had jet lag and so they had a lot of time where they were awake and I'd just wake up and they'd send me these things and then their Twitter account would get deleted. It was very strange. <laughs> this, is, this is some regional activism. These are people. These are our... They need young people in their groups. <laughs> There's a framework of community change called collective impact, and I like to think of the robo-debt movement as being an example of collective impact, with Not My Debt as the backbone organisation. People did a lot of things completely independent of us, but we had a role in curating, connecting and disseminating information, and building trust and community support, and of course, actually helping people. Robodeck connected me to the world of digital rights and thinking about what to do next, a call for board positions to Electronic Frontiers Australia <laughs> came up. So I took the plunge and ended up being chair for four years. Sitting on a board is a great way to actively participate. Unfortunately, none of our digital rights or technical communities have any funding and being volunteer run makes things incredibly hard. In Australia, we're also pretty shit at joining member organisations. Um, so if there is something you can do, or if you're in a position to support a paid one, even better. And if you're in a team, or you're a manager, or an owner of a team, tell them about the groups that are out there. Encourage them to join. We all need fresh energy, talent, and ideas. I'm going to take you, to a, uh, take you a moment to give you all a lecture here, in case you didn't think the rest of this was a lecture. Um, <laughs> in my five years on the board, the worst times were when people felt entitled to cause disruption, place demands and put their rudeness onto me or other board members. Toxic behaviour takes the very limited capability from people who are working for you for free and directs it to people management and wasted energy. It means all other functions of the group stop. People become upset and even question why they're doing anything at all. And when And when these issues build up and people feel attacked, the trust that we work so hard to build and maintain breaks down. I've had so many amazing ideas while being on the EFA board, and I have heard countless more from other people. But the harsh and sad reality is that ideas mean very little when you lack the resources and ability to action them. Simply, if you don't want to do it yourself, it is very hard to impose it on others to do in their free time. And that's how priorities get made. If you want things to be different, show up, participate, do the work. <laughs> but when it comes to digital rights, the community is not the enemy. Our enemy from where I stood was the government. I consider myself to be a politically active person, but I had no idea how um, politicised policy was until I saw how digital and technology policy worked. Bills that were worked on for two years by policymakers in government would get dropped with no warning and four weeks to respond. Oh, I'm supposed to give you... Oh, no, I, have, I should have a slide. Let me see. Who here knows about this bill? The Assistance and Access Bill, yeah. So the politicisation of this policy is something that every technologist should understand. And there's a lot of elements to that, but I'm just going to talk about a few. Firstly, the rhetoric of the rules of mathematics do not apply in Australia. And <laughs> and the impact of undermining encryption and destroying trust in Australian software and developers. 
Secondly, the way the Australian technical community was barely consulted, let alone the digital rights community. It is far easier for government to tick the boxes of consultation by talking to Google, Facebook, Twitter and the like. And why? Because they hire government relation managers whose job it is to manage, influence and placate ministers and staffers who don't understand the technology or the nuance. Laws relating to human rights and technology are not something any country should rush or put under a veil of secrecy. Yet that's how the Australian government has done things. And they do it because we let them, you and I. And thirdly, I think it's significant to note the way pol this, this particular policy was made into law. On the 6th of December, it was the last sitting day of parliament for the year. When this, when, this assistance, when the Assistance and Access Bill was passed. The then Labor opposition, in supporting it, used the process of how bills move between the houses to wedge through the Medivac legislation that allowed sick refugees and people seeking asylum in offshore detention to be brought to Australia. I had never seen anything like it before a shit show of evil policy because we feel entitled as a nation to break encryption and lock up humans on islands. And then we politicised it. We bundle up digital policy with defence and counter-terrorism, which means politically both sides ultimately agree with each other. Because in Australia, the only thing worse politically than looking like someone who is, tough, who is who's not tough on crime is looking like you're not tough on terrorism. And what does encryption have to do with a boomer thinking about retirement and protecting their negative gearing policy? Nothing. From volunteering on and working with NetThing, Australia's reboot of the Internet Governance Forum, an observation I have is that the stance of the IGF community to avoid taking positions on policy and rather be a place of discussion, debate and ideas, while noble, isn't that helpful for politicians. At the end of the day, they do need policies to pull out of their pocket. It's one of their jobs. So writing policy and position taking are all important, and we should do more of it at a multi-stakeholder level, ideally. But our coll collective actions have not been in vain. So don't let me discourage you. I'm giving you insight into the system and the process. And if you want things to be different, what's needed? We have been successful in creating momentum and holding back bad policy. And every time you make a phone call to an MP or you make a submission to a consultation, you make a difference. Even making a submission with something as simple as, I do not agree with or support this policy helps. Remember how I told you about Australia's low participation rate in apathy. Small ripples make waves. Okay, so I made you a little activity list over here. So you can have a look at this. You can think about the things that you can do. Let's touch back on the ro on robo debt um, and the Royal Commission because the hearings for that just wrapped up last week, um, and achieving a Royal Commission uh, is 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 a huge is a huge thing uh, and a and a big win for the community um, in a shit show. I won't even go there. <laughs> it was easy to be cynical about the Royal Commission because as they go, this one has been underfunded and given a tight time frame, although the Commissioner has extended it. But it has turned out to be extraordinary. They've, over 500,000 documents have been tendered. Morrison, Turnbull, Porter, Tudge, Robert, Payne, six former ministers, two of whom were prime ministers, were called to give evidence. The testimonies that people have given confirm what the community knew, saw and were told. We were right about the department culture, the willfulness to cause harm, the ideology, the illegality and the lure of topping up the budget for votes. Fortunately, through not my, with Not My Debt, we're able to have legal assistance to put together our submission. And Not My Debt was a movement led by women, mostly in regional communities. And it's a lesson in not underestimating women, especially when given digital tools to amplify and accelerate their abilities. 
One of the volunteers who we can only refer to as Kay because she's concerned about government retaliation has personally helped thousands of people. And with her amazing work, combined with our community manager and strategist Amy Patterson, our submission to the Royal Commission reads like a handbook in, into digital movement building. And it's a really great read. So with the remaining time, I'm going to talk to you about what I'm doing now. Because I think it's an area that's one of the greatest technical and people challenges of our time. I'll take a drink so you can think about it. So I've ended up with an ag tech company. Um, and I ended up with an ag tech company and with an app. And I got into apps because I started working on a digital identity app at a time when GDPR was coming in, blockchain was hot. Um, and that was about four or so years ago now. But it is really interesting how far the public has come on their attitudes towards uh, privacy and data in that time. Obviously, big data links and public inconvenience certainly help. But now I'm in this... Oh, sorry, we just jumped hard. So now I'm in this specialised area of ag. Um, um, and what we do is grow things in a straight line. And agriculture kind of boils down to this, if it's not animals, we're not talking about animals here. Um, but everything we grow is either in a paddock or in a line, like a row. Um, and so I enter the ag tech, ag tech community and there's, there's not a lot of tech in it. Um, it's really been a community that we've had to work on to build up and to develop. But this app had a really great idea, and the great idea was to put precision farming into the hands of farmers, bring in data so they could make localised decisions on what to put on their crops and where, and then the app turns into a tracking app on the phone GPS, because there are millions of tractors in the world with no technology at all. So I take on the CTO role and I get this app built. We get it built really well. It's got an amazing back end. It's lean, it's smart, it uses Mapbox, sophisticated data sharing that looks easy. It's actually pretty hot. But no one can use it. Because none of this, none of the, none of the rows, none of this digital infrastructure has been mapped. So while we've been mapping all of these other things, like using OpenStreetMaps and all of these other mapping projects, no one's been mapping um, foundational information that farmers need and need to be able to grow food. And so without that digital mapping, there's nowhere to layer the data onto. Um, there's nowhere to layer the data, um, and then there's no discussions about data. So growers are anxious about how their data is going to be used, and we haven't created any data licensing models that talk about data sovereignty, who gets to own what, what happens when it moves around, how we do that with consent. So it's been a real challenge in moving into an area with huge issues and a lack of digital infrastructure and trying to figure out how to actually do anything about it and get people to understand that are not technical why these things are so important. In most of regional Australia, a farmer's experience with tech isn't great. Ubiquitous connectivity is elusive and the advice they get is really complete. And they've all spent money on things that don't work, so why would they have faith in other applications? Yet we in this room know that data, AI, federated learning is the way of the future and that these things could help farmers and the systems of people and organisations that support them. But that system is broken. There's a lot of money for ideas, as long as those ideas come from universities and other safe institutions. And we all know how poorly they do at scale, commercialisation and action. Or maybe I'm just the only one that does. I feel like everyone should know. Um, and it leaves VCs, but now we've got Silicon Valley Bank collapsing. It's going to mean that people become even more risk adverse. And VCs are already out of their depth with ag tech or with funding big, complex ideas that matter. Give them a SaaS product you can throw Google AdWords at, set and forget and make heaps of money, and they're comfortable with that. But big digital challenges, no. Um, so that's been a really interesting area to get into, and it's really quite scary. Um, and so I'm going to leave you with my ask. 
Um, and my ask is what I want to leave you with and what I want you to do. And maybe start by going home on the weekend and watching Mad Max and start to become very concerned about the future of the world and where we're going in a few years. Those floods that we've stopped reporting on, they've destroyed crops and interrupted the supply chain. Dramatic weather events are going to be the norm with, ra with rain or without. And don't think that people in the regions are taking care of things. Regional communities are struggling, farmers are ageing out, young people are not returning. So this is a global issue because food is a global issue. And so the hope is technology and technology that technology makes things. It makes things better, it makes things more interesting, and it's fun. So I'd like everyone here to think about what you can build and share and get vocal. Your political influence is significant. So ask questions, because if we don't have food security, people are going to start getting really annoyed. Uh, I do have some time for questions, if anyone has any questions about all the areas of my talk. Yeah. Um, not a question, but can you tell everybody that they should be caring about the privacy, reforms of the Privacy Act that are happening? Well, this would be a great opportunity to practice those decision making and MP voting skills. Yeah, absolutely. You should be caring about the Privacy Act and the review of reforms to the Privacy Act, which is actually it is actually a good win. And do we have Justin here? Yeah, there you are. Hello. So Justin's the chair of EFA. What is EFA? So we can you can join EFA, make calls, make some make some noise about this. I mean, I think I never want to be too optimistic about government, uh, but, <laughs> but we do have a different government, um, and so we could go into that government with some hope and some optimism, um, and we've, a review is a, is a good thing. Um, the community is really concerned about privacy, so it means that um, what the public is looking for is action, and then what the um, politicians are looking for is the technical response from this community around the things that we, we can do. Um, and we have have always been a, an influential group when it comes to um, to technology policy. So don't don't let me discourage you um, because it is it is it is really important. And I saw through it, my time with EFA um, the impact that this community has made over many years. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, one of the first, I, be asking for it. Um, uh, COVID has, the opportunity with COVID to move, and as things have moved online, has done a few things. One, it's made people think about where we're living and what lifestyle looks like, so people have started moving to the regions. It's actually putting huge pressure on housing and other services in the region, so people are trying to respond to that. Um, I sit on a board, and as soon as, there, as soon as it was clear that COVID was an issue, I got everyone on that board to move to video conferencing. Um, and some of these are people that you would have to drag them kicking and screaming to even consider this and they love it and now they get it because you can have meetings you know we've all been doing meetings and work and things online and now that is understood throughout regional communities that that's an effective way to work it it, it gets things done businesses realize that um, and what um, policy makers and people that were in cities and trying to deliver services or monitor how things were going in regions they had to talk to people in the regions so a lot of capacity building also happened within leadership within the regions. And that should be something that we, we maintain. 
I think that there's a huge opportunity for um, even Main Street renewal and revitalisation of how we think about regional towns. Um, and one of the first things is actually to start asking for that sort of space. Um, I've been looking for a space in my regional community because I want to put some young people in and get them mapping. Um, and they're great entry-level tech jobs, but every single building or community asset or anything that's useful, it's just got a group of over 65s in it, and there's just there's just no there's just no space. Um, but anyone, everyone, if, you know, having a job and uh, being able to bring economy to the area and potential jobs to the area, you have a huge amount of social capital and influence over your councils. Um, and they only mainly hear from people that are complaining about the roads and the footpaths. So give them something more interesting to think about. Uh, and there are also really interesting grants. And I've been looking at grants for a long time. And a few years ago, you just couldn't put anything digital into a grant. It, it was just it was never going to connect with someone that understood it in any way. Um, but that's really changing now. Um, and I'd really like to see openness and sharing around around those things. Um, one of the things that we found that we had to do with um, with uh, stuff with platform and in, in the agriculture sector was um, I built a Drupal site called Collaboriculture where we could just start to put collaborative information and open information about uh, things relating to farming and ag tech. We set up a Git repository. We created um, an open database structure for managing this sort of mapping and, and rows. So doing some of that intentional infrastructure stuff and applying those things that we do in open source communities to some of those community challenges, but doing it in an open way and kind of pointing at how easy this stuff is because people in regions think things are very, very difficult um, and we know that things are actually really, really easy and um, so it really helps them when they see the things that could be spun up quite quickly um, or used and tested quite quickly. That's okay. Anything else? Good. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Lindsay, for that presentation. And Before you run away, <laughs> a small token of our appreciation for you presenting this morning. So thank you very much.